use your inspirational stories. And use those inspirational stories to retain an optimism that becomes a force multiplier. And everybody now in our country and the world is talking about, oh my, doom and gloom, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if you have a fundamental belief in Canada in a 33 million population, that's probably one of the highest, if not the highest educated in the world, with enormous resources across our great country from coast to coast to coast, you have faith that things aren't all bad and life is pretty good and it will recover and will get better. And so I look at a lady like Jackie Girard, and I'm inspecting her on her graduation from basic training last spring, and Jackie is 46 years old. She wanted to join the Canadian Forces. I had seen her the night before she went on basic training. My wife and I know Jackie very well, and she was a little, a little worried, but she was determined. The platoon of 50 people, the average age was 19 years old. Jackie got them all together on day one and said, I'm 46, I'm old enough to be the mother of everybody else here, I'm going to be successful on this course, I'm going to pass, and if I can do it, you bloody well can. And that's how Jackie would put it. We had the highest pass rate on a basic training platoon that we have had in probably 15 to 25 years, all because of her setting the example, et cetera. 46 years old. Now, Jackie inspired me in another way, too. Jackie lost her husband in Afghanistan on the 27th November, 2006. He was the senior soldier in the battle group, RSM Bobby Girard, killed by a suicide bomber in Kandahar City that attacked his vehicle as he was returning from having spent two weeks leave with Jackie. Uh, got back in Kandahar Airfield, driving out with the armored vehicle to the forward operating base and got attacked and died. And Jackie had a pretty tough time. And she's got the family of two boys, and one girl, and so I put my arm around her that night before she went to basic, and I said, so Jackie, how's it going? And she said, well, you know, pretty well. Times are tough. Times are, are balancing out, though. And she said, the boys were home this weekend. They went out in the garage. They lit the stove out there, just like Bobby used to do, and things were pretty good. She said, you know what I noticed? I noticed if I smile more, they smile more. And I thought to myself, what an incredible lesson from a, a lady with the heart of a lion. I remember back to 4 July 2007, and I can come to this, that optimism is a force multiplier, and as a leader, you've got to exhibit that in every way you think about it. 4 July 07, we had a terrible attack in Afghanistan. We lost six young soldiers, and it was a tough day, and we worked through the evening handling the consequences of that, learning lessons from it to prevent anything else from occurring. The next morning was my senior operations meeting, about 20 civilians and military around the table, all senior. The briefing started, it was a normal weekly briefing, they were briefing the attack, and I looked around the table, and my goodness, everybody looked like they were beaten and broken, like death warmed over. Some of, the, uh, some of the people, several of the people around the table had tears in their eyes running down their face, and I stopped the briefing, and I said, look, you know, we've had a terrible day, and here's what we are going to do as a leaders. We're going to look after those soldiers who died. We're going to give them all the dignity and respect and return their bodies to Canada with all the ceremony that they have earned. We're going to look after their battle buddies who have been shocked by this also. We're going to look after their families back in Canada without any qualifiers on that help. And we're going to make sure that we can help them through the worst days of their lives. And then we're going to support them as long as they need our support. And we're going to do all those things. And we're going to do them right and professionally. And from the point of view of the leadership here, we're going to do them in the next 10 seconds. Because if we walk out of the room with our faces down, and our shoulders slumped because we think we're beaten here and we've lost confidence in what we are doing, within a day, the 89,000 other people in the organization will be exactly that way, and we will have let them down. And so we've got to walk out of here with our backs straight, knowing that we're doing the right thing, and knowing that we're going to look after those who have suffered so badly, but we have a responsibility to those other 90,000 and their families to make sure we set the tone correctly. And you know yourself, you walk down the street, walk into a room, you smile at people, they will smile back. How the leader behaves, setting that tone of optimism. And I got to say, kudos to Prime Minister Harper for trying to do that and getting sort of raked over the coals all the time for it. But that is the responsibility and I believe the job of a leader. Jackie is there. I'm inspecting her. Her son is the young man in the blue uniform, a cadet at Royal Military College. Her other son wasn't there because he was deployed into Afghanistan as a young corporal in the 1st Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment. And her daughter, who was seven months pregnant, was sitting on a chair, and, and her feet were swollen, so she did not want to walk. And uh, her daughter was the one that said she wanted nothing to do with the military. Uh, she was tired of her dad and now her mom being in and moving around the country and her two brothers in. And so she was sitting on, in the audience there. 
next to her husband, who was a corporal in the 1st Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment, so her words didn't go quite with her actions. Uh, optimism is a force multiplier, and if you can't use the inspirational stories in your organization to multiply that, you're missing a beat. We made a, we made a determined effort using the crises that we were facing when we started to take casualties in our operations to change some things fundamentally, and we couldn't have done it, that dark cloud and silver lining in it, we could not have done it without the sort of crises that we were facing with those casualties. And we made a, a determination we were going to support our families differently. If the family breaks now, the young soldier, sailor, airman, or airwoman across the world will break instantly because they'll know about it within five minutes because of global communications. You know, we used to have a saying in the Canadian Forces, in the Army, was that if the Army wanted you to have a family, we would have issued you one, right? And that colored everything we did under how we looked at our families. And in fact, what we looked at them as was, as was excess baggage. And you had to handle your family by get on with your job. And we determined to change that, putting a whole variety of support into place so that when you're away, like Edwin, and the baby arrives before you get back, maybe with a video teleconference that we could set up, you get an opportunity to see your newborn son, as it was in this case, or a newborn daughter. We made a determination to support those kids. And one of the little things we did is uh, raise money to buy teddy bears for the children of deploying soldiers from one of our units. Teddy bear with a combat uniform on it, put the kid's name on it, a regimental badge, and in the belly, we inserted a digital recorder. And mom or dad, before they deploy, can read a bedtime story, you know, talk about something that the is important to the child and to them. And when that child is lonely or sick or tired or whatever, they can cuddle that teddy bear, push the little button, and hear their mom's or dad's voice. And it's a pretty incredible thing. The people who come out and stand on the 50 overpasses in their thousands, boy, those families in a way that we simply could not do ourselves. It's absolutely incredible to see them out there. Doesn't make it any better for the families, but because they know the loss has been noted, has been appreciated, and is remembered, and is respected, it's not getting worse for them. Because if they thought it was the opposite of that, the day certainly would be much worse for them. We made a determination we were going to look after our wounded soldiers. And again, never waste a crisis. Because we were in combat operations, we could blow through that 50 years of, of bureaucracy and allow us to do what we felt we had to do without being constrained. This is Master Corporal Paul Franklin, one of our combat medics, shown here, as he says, looking for Osama bin Laden. I think that's why the guy's eyes are popped out so much. He's really inspecting it carefully. Paul was a combat medic in Afghanistan, was blown up on 15 January 2006, lost both of his legs above the knee. And one of the things that we have learned in caring for amputees is that if you lose your legs above the knee, you probably will never walk again. Lose them below the knee, almost anything is possible. Paul, no reverse on him, said, I'm going to walk again. Uh, I'm going to also continue to be a soldier, and I'm going to change how we look after our wounded, particularly the amputees. I'm going to help others change, and he's done that with the Australian forces. He's done that at Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, D.C., and he's done it with the British Army in a way that's quite incredible, and we built up upon his inspirational work because we had given him the support that was crucial. For the guy who said would never walk again, he walked out onto the ice at Scotiabank Place between a game between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Ottawa Senators and dropped the puck. Refused to take the wheelchair out, walked out on it, just a year after he had been blown up. His son Simon was with him. I was standing to the side, gave Simon the puck. Said, Simon, go ahead, drop the puck. 20,000 people watching. Simon said, nope. So you're getting a little stressful, because you can see the face of every one of those 20,000, right? Simon says, nope. So we finally, Matt's asked him why he wouldn't drop the puck. He thought if he dropped the puck, he wouldn't get it back anymore, and he wasn't going to let it go from his little hand. So I think finally, Matt Sundin, the second praise of Matt Sundin, Matt Sundin convinced him to drop the puck, and we got through that sort of what seemed like two hours, but was probably about four seconds of stress with Simon to drop the puck. Last March, up in the mountains not far from here, Paul had this picture taken, which he sent to me. This is the guy who people said would never walk again, right, coming down the mountain. I joked with him that he didn't show me the second photo, taken 40 feet further down the mountain when he's lying on his ass in the snowbank trying to get up. But Paul Franklin is one of those guys who we got to return far greater than what, what our actions had been, and our actions had been designed to support him in every way that was possible. And I just say sometimes you just got to be who you need to be as a leader and leave that with it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your welcome here today. And what a pleasure it is to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.